Dad, they're Thomas. Dad, let Thomas do that one. Thomas, come and give your granddad a hand, then. Come on. Tomorrow's Christmas. You can't always have a white Christmas, Thomas. You should be used to that. It shouldn't rain. Oh, it, it doesn't snow like it used to. Well, but then it isn't Christmas yet, is it? What? Well, it's only Christmas Eve. Do you mean it's going to snow tomorrow? I don't know, mate. Granddad said it's going to snow tomorrow. He didn't say that, Thomas. Dad. Oh, we've all had. So isn't it time that uh, Tom has opened his Christmas Eve present, then? Eh? Yeah. So, what should it be, then? What's that lovely knit cap? Mm -hmm. What about that package for Uncle Di in a minute? Oh, he always sends uh, socks, doesn't he? Scratchy ones, socks, lovely. But you can't clean with socks. Well, I think socks is a very good present. It's a rule that Christmas Eve present has to be a toy or a book or something good. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, don't you, Chloe? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So is it time now, then? Yes, please. Here you are. Happy Christmas, Thomas. Merry Christmas Eve, Thomas. Merry Christmas, Boyle. What's that, I wonder? I don't know. Come on, then open it. This little socks. You sure? John gave you that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. a long time ago. Before I was born. Oh, yes. Before I was born, yes. Yeah. Grandpa, it's no Christmas when you were born. Oh, yes, Thomas. It's no. Christmas was so much like another in those years around the sea town corner. Now an out of all sound. Except the distant speaking of the voices I sat down here a moment before sleep. That I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was twelve. Or whether it snowed for twelve days and twelve nights when I was six. And you All the Christmases rolled down towards the Welsh speaking sea. Like a snowball growing whiter and bigger and rounder. Like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street. And they stop at the rim of the ice edge, fish freezing waves. And I plunge my hands in the snow and bring out whatever I can find. Holly or robins or pudding. Squabbles and carols and oranges and tin whistles and fire in the front room and Mango the crackers and holy, 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 ring the bells. <laughs> In goes my hand into that wool white, bell tongued ball of holidays, resting at the rim of the carol singing sea. And out comes Mrs. Prothero and the firemen. It was on the afternoon of Christmas Eve. And I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden, waiting for cats with her son, Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December, in my memory, is white as Lapland, although there were no reindeers. But there were cats. Patient, cold, and callous, her hands wrapped in socks, 
we waited to snowball. The cats. Sleek and long as jaguars and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slink and sidle over the white back garden walls. And the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, fur capped and moccasin trappers from Hudson Bay, off Marbles Road, would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of our eyes. The wise cats never appear. We were so still, Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows. Eternal ever since Wednesday. Have we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden? Or if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder. We ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms toward the house, and smoke indeed was pouring out of the parlour, and the gong was bombinated, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing on a wall in a row. We bounded into the house, laden with snowballs, and stopped to the door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning all right, but there was no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke, and Mr. Provero standing in the middle of it, waving his slipper as if he were conducting. Call the fire brigade! Oh, they won't be there. It's Christmas! We'll do something. We threw our snowballs into the smoke. I think they missed Mr. Frodo and ran out of the house to the telephone box. Just in time, they turned it on. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas Eve. and peered in at them. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs. Jim and I waited very quietly to hear what she would say to them. She said the right thing always. Would you like anything to read? Birds, the colour of red flannel petticoats, whisked past the half-shaped hills. 
and they sang and wallowed all night and day in caves that smelled like sunny afternoons in dark front farmhouse parlours. And they chased with the jawbones of deacons, the English and the bears. Before the motor car, before the wheel, before the duchess faced horse, when we rode the daft and happy hills bareback, it snowed and it snowed. It snowed last year too. I made the snowman. My friend knocked it down, so I knocked him down. And then we had tea. But it was not the same snow. Our snow was not only shaken from whitewashed buckets down the sky, it came shortly out of the ground and swam and drifted out of the arms and bodies of the trees. Snow grew overnight on the roofs of houses like a pure in Grandfather Moss. Minutely white ivy the walls and settled on the postman opening the gate like a dumb, numb thunderstorm of white torn Christmas cards. Was that postman then too? The sprinkling eyes and wind cherried noses on spread frozen feet, they crunched up to the doors and mittened on them manfully. What all the children could hear was the ringing of bells. You mean the postman went rat a tat tat and the doors rang? I mean that the bells the children could hear. Well, inside them. I only hear thunder sometimes, never bells. There were church bells too. Inside them? No, no, no. In the back black, snow white belfries, tied by bishops and storks. And they rang their tidings over the bandaged town, over the frozen foam of the powder and ice cream hills, over the crackling sea. It seemed that all the churches boomed for joy under my window. And the weathercocks crew for Christmas on our fence. Get back to the postman. Oh, well, they were just ordinary postmen, fond of walking and dogs and Christmas and the snow. They knocked on the door with green knuckles. And then they stood on the right to welcome back in the little drifted porches and huffed and puffed, making ghosts of their breath and jogged from foot to foot like small boys wanting to go out. And then the presents, after the Christmas box. Oh, cute. Come here. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Have a nice Christmas. Happy Christmas. And the cold postman with a rose on his button nose Tingled down the tea tree, slithered run of the chilly, glinting hill. He went in his ice barn boots like a man on fishmonger's slabs. He wiped his bag like a frozen camel's hump, dizzily turned the corner on one foot, and by God, he was gone. Where did he go? Oh, he went to deliver letters and presents to other families. Oh, the Christmas presents, doesn't he? He does, boy, with the, the postman. That brings presents to people who live far away, like, uh, like Uncle Guy. Will Father Christmas be able to get you in such heavy rain? Of course, boy. And why do you think he uses reindeer? I'm not going to sleep tonight. Aren't you now? I'll go to the bed, but I'm staying awake until Father Christmas comes, so I can see him. I used to try that. Did you ever see him? No, I never did. But on Christmas Eve, milk and biscuits waiting by the fire, I would hang at the foot of my bed Bessie Barter's black stocking. And always, I said, I would stay awake all the moonlit night to hear the roof of lighting reindeer and see the hollow boot descend through so. Soon the sand of the snow drifted into my eyes, and though I stared toward the far face and around the flickering room where the black sack-like stocking hung, I was asleep before the chimney trembled and the room was red and white with Christmas. Mm -hmm.
snow melted on the bedroom floor, the stocking bulged and brimmed. It was Christmas. Yet. Now, straight up, no messing. Christmas. <laughs> Don't I know it. You don't be sleeping through it, do you, with all your aunties and uncles here? Katie, do you know where that photo is? What photo? You know, why are you all pressed up? Oh, Dad, I'm trying to get the boy to bed. Oh, just a minute, I know it's here. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we are there. That's true. Oh, I forgot now. Oh, Lord. Look, Katie. Now, these were the youthful presents, the engulfing mufflers of the old coach days, and mittens made for giant sloths, zipper scarves of a substance like silky gum that could be tug of war down to the galoshes, blinding tam shunters like patchwork tea causes, and bunny-seated busbies and balaclavas for victims of head-shrinking tribes. From aunts who always wore wool next to the skin, there were moustached and rasping vests that made you wonder why the aunts had any skin left at all. And once, I had a little crocheted nose bag from an aunt. Alas, no longer whinnying with us. And pictureless books, in which small boys, though warned with quotations not to, would skate on Farmer Giles's pond, and did, and drowned. And folks have told me everything about the wasp. Except why? Go on, go on to the useless presents. Oh yes, the useless presents. Well, there were bags of moist and many-coloured jelly babies, and a folded flag, and a false nose, and a tram conductor's cap, and a machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Never a counterpart. Once, by a mistake that no one could explain, a little hatchet. Oh, and a celluloid duck that made, when you pressed it, a most unduck-like sound. A mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow. <laughs> and a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the sea and the animals any colour I pleased. And still the dazzling sky blue sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow bills and pea green birds. We had hard boils, toffee, fudge, and all sorts, crunchies, crackles, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter Welsh for the Welsh. There was a company, gallant and scarlet, but never nice to taste, although I always tried when very young, of belted and busbid and musketed lead soldiers so soon to lose their heads and legs in the walls. Troops who, if they could not fight, could always run.
laughter and there were snakes and families and happy letters and easy hobby games for little engineers complete with instructions. Easy. <laughs> oh, easy for Leonardo. Oh, don't you worry, Matty. Oh, to make the dogs bark, to wake up the old man next door, to make him beat on the wall with his stick, to shake our picture off the wall. Be quiet. Like in our house. Always uncles at Christmas. The same uncles. Would you like some tea? Oh, no, thank you, dear. Oh, piano in the parlor, all through the thimble hiding, musical cheering, blind man's bluffing party on a never to be forgotten day at the end of the unremembered year. And on Christmas mornings I would go out with my packet of cigarettes. You put one in your mouth and you stood at the corner of the street and you waited for hours in vain for an old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette. And then, with a smirk, you ate it. Then with dog-disturbing whistles and sugar fags, I would scour the swatched town for news of the little world, and find always a dead bird by the white post office or by the deserted swings. Perhaps a robin, all but one of its fires out, and that fire still burning on his breast. chapel with taproom noses and wind bust cheeks, all albinos, huddled the stiff black jarring feathers against the irreligious snow. and all the front parlors. There was sherry and walnuts and bottled beer and crackers by the dessert spoons. And cats in their fur abouts watched the fires and the high heaped fire spat all ready for the chestnuts and the mulling pokers. Some few large men sat in the front parlors without their collars, uncles almost certainly, trying their new cigars, holding them out judiciously at arm's length, returning them to their mouths, coughing, then holding them out again as though waiting for an explosion. And some few small aunts, not wanted in the kitchen, nor anyone else for that matter, sat on the very edges of their chairs, poised and brittle, afraid to break like faded cups and saucers. Those mornings trot 
out of hiding streets. An old man always, fawn bowler, yellow gloved. And at this time of year, with spats of snow, would take his constitutional to the white bowling green and back, as he would take it wet or fine on Christmas Day or Doomsday. Sometimes, two hale young men with big pipes blazing, no overcoats and wind-blown scarves, would trudge unspeaking down to the forlorn sea. To work up an afternoon, to blow away the fumes, who knows? To walk into the waves until nothing of them was left but the two curling smoke clouds of that inextinguishable briars. Dashing home, the gravy smell of the dinners of others, the bird smell of the brandy, the pudding and mince, coiling up to my nostrils. When out of a snow-clogged side lane would come a boy, the spit of myself, with a pink-tipped cigarette and the violet past of a black eye, cocky as a bullfinch, leering all to himself. him on sight and sound and would be just about to put my dog whistle to my lips and blow him off the face of Christmas when suddenly he with a violent wink put his whistle to his lips and blew so stridently so high so exquisitely loud that doubling faces that cheeks bulged with goose would press against the tinsel windows the whole length of the white echoing street <laughs> The dinner we had turkey stuffed with walnut dressing, little potatoes, and wine. Always wine. silver threepenny bit with a current on it and the someone was always Uncle Arnold. Oh, 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 oh. Mm. Mm. Don't bother boy, I got the threepenny bit right here. <laughs> oh, look. There's a shoe lock. Have you got a shoe horn to open it with boy? <laughs> And after dinner, the uncle sat in front of the fire, loosened all buttons, put their large, moist hands over their watch chains, groaned a little, and slept. Oh, good. Mm. <sighs> nice drop of port. Oh, thank you, my dear. <laughs> Better in the night. aunts and sisters scuttled to and fro bearing tureens. Auntie Bessie, who had already been frightened twice by a clockwork mouse, whipped out of the sideboard 
and add some air to the wine. Mm. The dog was sick. Auntie Dozy had to have three aspirins. But Auntie Hannah, who liked port, stood in the middle of the snowbound backyard, singing like a big bosom thrush. sit among festoons and Chinese lanterns and nipple dates and try to make a model man of war following the instructions for little engineers. But instead, I would produce what might be mistaken for a seagoing tram car. And I remembered that on the afternoon of Christmas Day, when the others sat around the fire and told each other that this was nothing, no nothing to the great snowbound and turkey-proud yule log-cracking, holly berry bedizened and kissing under the mistletoe Christmas when they were children. I would go out, my bright new boots squeaking, into the white world, onto the seaward hill, to call on Jim and Dan and Jack and to pad through the still streets, leaving huge, deep footprints on the hidden pavement.
the snow-blind travelers lost on the North Hills. And vast dew-lapped dogs with flasks round their necks ambled and shambled up to us, baying, Excelsior! We returned home through the poor streets where only a few children fumbled with bare red fingers in the wheel-rutted snow and cat called after us. Their voices fading away as we trudged uphill into the cries of the dock birds and the hooting of ships out in the whirling bay. And then, at tea, the recovered uncles would be jolly and an ice cake loomed in the center of the table like a marble grave. Auntie Hannah laced her tea with rum because it was only once a year. It all sounds like an ordinary Christmas to me. But it was. Christmas when you were a boy wasn't any different to Christmas now. Oh, but it was, it was. Why was Christmas different then? I mustn't tell you. Why can't Christmas be the same for me as it was for you when you were a boy? I mustn't tell you. Because it's Christmas now. What have you been there, young man? Grandad was telling me a story. Well, it's past your bedtime. Thomas? Are you just about to go up? Where are you going now? Heaven, you should have a father Christmas. He's so excited. You stay awake all night if you allow him to. It would be nice if it's snow for the mine. Well, it's a big day tomorrow. I think I'll go to bed. Good night, Dad. Thanks for keeping an eye on him. Oh, there's no trouble, it's a pleasure. He sits there good as gold while I ramble on. He seems interested, too. <laughs> Is that enough for Father Christmas, do you think? I need more. Oh, don't worry, Bach. If you want some more, I'll know where to find them. Hope so, anyway. Come along, Thomas. I'll tuck you in. <laughs> good night, then, son. Sleep well. Good night, Carrie. And, uh, Thomas, remember, not too early, right? All right. Good night. Is this is not the time you look like when you're up. Oh, yeah. Just the same. Good night. Don't you dare. Ho, ho, ho. Would you like to hear more? Yes, please. Bring out the tall tales now that be told by the fire as we roasted chestnuts and the gaslight bubbled below. Ghosts with their heads under their arms trailed their chains and said, Ooh, like owls in the long night when I dare not look over my shoulder. Wild beasts lurked in the cubbyhole under the stairs with a gas meter. Okay. I remember we went singing carols once, when there wasn't a shaving of a moon to light the flying streets. Oh. <laughs> At the end of a long road was a drive that led to a large house. And we stumbled up the darkness of the drive that night, each one of us afraid, each one holding a stone in his hand, in case, and all of us too brave to say a word. The wind through the trees made noises as of old and unpleasant, and maybe web-footed men wheezing in caves. We reached the black bulk of the house. Christmas comes but once a year? No, no. Go pin wench at last. I'll count three. One, two, three. Good King Wenchless last looked out on the feast of Steve. And we began to sing, our voices high and seemingly distant in the snow-felted darkness round the house that was occupied by nobody we knew. Though the frost was cruel, 
We stood close together near the dark door. And then a small dry voice of someone who has not spoken for a long time joined our singing. A small dry eggshell voice from the other side of the door. A small dry voice through the keyhole. Thou and I shall see him die when we bear them fear. And when we stopped running, we were outside our house. Perhaps it was a ghost. Dan was always reading. room was lovely. Balloons floated under the hot water bottle gulping gas. Everything was good again and shone over the town.
my bedroom window, out into the moonlight and the unending smoke-colored snow. I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses on our hill, and hear the music rising from them of the long, steadily falling night. Yeah.